Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. I've been asked to uh, give a brief presentation uh, of the issue of food insecurity. And uh, of course, the, I'm representing here the Budapest Center for Mass Atrocities Prevention. And uh, unla un unlike uh, might seem, food security and mass atrocities prevention are very interlinked. Uh, next slide, yeah. So on food, sec food insecurity, what do we mean by food insecurity? Uh, food insecurity is the state of being without reliable access to sufficient quantity of uh, affordable, nutritious food. And uh, the food scarcity actually uh, endangers the capacity of, uh, of human beings to, to live uh, in, a, in, a, in a physical and, uh, and psychological comfort. Um, this as well brings a lot of uh, tensions into uh, what we uh, live and, uh, and survive in, in societies. On, on food security, what is food security instead? Food security is a concept that was originated uh, in the mid-70s uh, and uh, is part of the overall concept of, uh, of human security. It's one of the seven principles of human security. Uh, uh, human security is... Uh, fundamentally set on seven principles of uh, food security, uh, health security, uh, community security, political security, uh, personal security, environmental security. All these seven dimensions are actually the prerequisite for uh, human beings to be able to live together uh, and actually to support peace efforts. Um, as defined by the, by the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, food security exists when all people and all time have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, uh, which meets their dietary needs and food preference for an active and healthy life. Food, next slide, thank you. Food security analysis factors. Uh, here we see the fact that uh, food security itself is um, combined by food availability, food access, and food utilization. The three, the three dimensions are actually are part of, um, of the niche of food security. There is one very important element in the overall setting of food security that is not just the food availability and the food access and the food utilization, but actually the food quality. One of the things that we always need to thank is that not only food quantity is important in order to nutrit every, every one of us, children to, uh, to older and elders, uh, but as well as the quality of food. It's something that I think that in the overall concept of the Climate Change Week here at the, at the Low Justice and Development Week, we are trying to analyze as well the legal background for the dimension of, um, of food security connected to climate change. Next slide. One of the things that uh, we try to combat while thinking about food insecurity is, of course, the fact that, as I said, food insecurity exists when people do not have adequate um, physical, social, or, or economic access uh, to sufficient safe and uh, nutritious food, something that I think that also Marco Muzumeci will speak about uh, later on, about the fact that uh, food contraction and, uh, uh, and, and the level and capacity of food to uh, commit to the levels of uh, sufficient safety and nutritious elements are, are important and, um, and actually understandably important, not just for the healthy life of people, but uh, for the development of communities. Next slide. On, this is the FAO hunger map. Uh, it was developed a uh, few, few years ago in 2015. Uh, this is a map that actually shows us the capacity of uh, food security in, in, in every continent. As you might see, we have an important dimension of food insecurity in the African continent, but as well in Asia and Latin America to some extent, especially Central America. Uh, one of the things that the report actually underlines is that by 2030, we are expecting Africa to leverage the level of tensions between communities because of food scarcity and uh, 
lack of water, which is very connected then to, to, the, to the whole uh, planning of, uh, of food security. Something that we've been discussing in the, uh, even yesterday on, on, on a panel on um, uh, water diplomacy and water scarcity in, uh, at world level, and uh, what technologies and, uh, and actually legal instruments are able to uh, do in order to provoke access to uh, water and food uh, in every continent by 2030. Uh, according to Feeding America, uh, in 2015, 42.2 million Americans lived in food insecure households. This is to say that food insecurity is not something that is related only to underdeveloped or developing words. Um, is also something that uh, lives in our societies, in Western societies, and uh, is something that actually affects especially children. If we are thinking about, uh, even in the same report of Feeding America, we had the, the, the share of 17% of households with children that were reported to face food insecurity at significant higher rates of those without children. In, 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 in America. Next slide. On the FAO, the state of food insecurity in the World Report, the last available estimate indicates that about 795 million people in the world, just over one in nine, were undernourished in between 2014 and 2016. Undernourishment. Uh, uh, for FAO uh, is, is a person that is not able to acquire enough, enough food to meet their daily man, minimum dietary energy requirements over a period of one year. And FAO defines hunger as being the synonymous with chronic undernourishment. This is to say that we are only facing at a very uh, limited map, but uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see the, the percentage of uh, unnourished uh, populations in the world. We are facing the capacity of combating unnourishment, but at the same time, the capacity of uh, combating unnourishment in, uh, in underdeveloped worlds is getting more and more difficult rather than in developing countries. Next slide. There is an issue with food security and responsibility. Um, as I just briefly told you, um, food security is part of the whole dimension of human security. Human security is a commitment that states made uh, already in, uh, in, in the years 2000 on, uh, on the willingness of uh, the international community to responsibly uh, act in the empowerment of food uh, security, but as well of all the other dimensions of human security. Uh, the Committee of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, in, in its general commitment uh, in May 1999, confirms that the right to adequate food is indivisibly linked to the inherent dignity of the human person and is indispensable for the fulfillment of other human rights, enshrined in the bill of human rights. At the same time, the right of adequate food is indivisibly linked to the inherent dignity of the human person and is indispensable for the fulfillment of other human rights enshrined in the International Bill of Human Rights. The right of adequate food, like any other human right, imposes three types of or level of obligation on state parties. The obligation to respect, the obligation to protect, and the obligation to fulfill. The things that governments can do to strengthen food and nutrition security might be usefully divided into four broad categories. Respect, protect, facilitate, and provide. Next slide. On this, climate change which is the theme of the LGD week this year, encompasses global warming, but refers to the broader range of changes that are happening in our planet. These include rising sea levels, striking mountain glaciers, accelerating ice, 
melting Greenland, Antarctica and the Arctic, and shift in flower plant blooming times, which is actually very well connected to the capacity of providing food at all levels. To the bottom right in the chart produced by NASA, showing the average temperature difference over time would clearly showcase the increase of global surface temperature, another direct effect of climate change and changing weather patterns that are actually affecting a lot our food security capacity. Between 2003 and 2013, natural hazards and disasters in the developing regions affected more than 1.9 billion people and resulted in nearly half a trillion US dollars in estimate damages. Of 48 developing countries, approximately 22% of the economic impact was taken by the agriculture industry, which affects food security. Next slide. And this to get to the link between mass atrocities and food security. According to the World Bank Policy Research Report titled Breaking the Conflict Trap, Civil War and Development Policy, two thirds of the world food insecure people live in seven countries, namely India, China, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Ethiopia, of which all but China have experienced civil conflict in the past decade. Agriculture economist Marshall Burke of the University of California, Berkeley, states that, and we quote, we find that civil wars were much more likely to happen in warmer than average years, with one degree Celsius warmer temperatures in a given year associated with 75% higher likelihood of conflict in that year. Burke and his team also believe that average temperature might warm by at least one degree Celsius by 2030. Because of this, they believe that there could be potentially an increase of civil war incidents in Africa by 55% by the year 2030, as I was mentioning before. And the team estimates that these war results could result in, in around 390,000 deaths. We see direct linkage of mass atrocities and food insecurity in countries like Sudan. In the case of the four, this correlation was even brought to the public attention in 2007 by when former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon was among many to declare Darfur an ecologically rooted crisis with climate change being at least part of the cause. Ban Ki-moon also said that um, other links have made uh, between atrocities and conflicts in places such as Burkina Faso, Niger, the Ivory Coast and Somalia. As you would see, and the uh, last slide um, is the termination of this uh, very brief presentation. Um, we wanted to underline in a way the capacity of food security actually to, to be a cause of uh, mass atrocities, but as well a cause, an uh, inherent cause of uh, what mass atrocity then produces, which partly is uh, a lot of migration. Um, a lot of uh, domestic and international conflicts, especially in Africa, but not only. I think that we are going to face political instability in many regions of the world, connected to the lack of scarcity of uh, water, but as well the scarcity of food. Again, one of the things that we tend to uh, always push is uh, on, on the state of food security is partially based not just on food quantity, but on food quality. The capacity of people to survive and live, actually, in a world where they can enjoy food is part of the uh, likelihood of, of events that might uh, give them the capacity to survive peacefully in, the, in, in their regions and in their communities. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I expect you to uh, maybe visit us on Thursday 8, tomorrow. At 4 p.m., we will have a full panel uh, with a lot of experts on food security, climate change, and the risk of mass atrocities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enzo. Can I ask you to have a seat here? Um, <clears throat> next up, we've got Marco Musumeci.
Um, Marco is representing the UN Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute. Um, we're just going to pull up your slides. So in the meantime, maybe you could just introduce yourself quickly and, and tell us a little bit about the UN Interregional inter Crime Justice and uh, Crime Justice Research Institute. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm coordinating all the activities that we do on organized crime and counterfeiting. And that's the angle I will touch during my, my presentation. Unicri, easier to say rather than United Nations Interregional Crime and Justice Research Institute, we focus on organized crime and crime prevention. So we touch everything that is organized crime activity. Um, I think Enzo touched several times the, the idea of the importance of food quality. I will build into, into that, but specifically focusing on uh, one element. I mean, does, does food quality also pass through the fight against organized crime? And how are some organized crime activities directly influencing the quality of food? Let's have a look into that. But before we do that, we, I think we have to do a step back because the, the overall idea of uh, food fraud and counterfeit food it suffers from the same problem or the general idea of uh, what are counterfeit products and if they are really a dangerous phenomenon. The general perception is that uh, this is just an economic crime and that organized crime is not involved in that at all and that counterfeiting is just... Uh, something done by some guys in the garage putting the products into the market. So first of all, we will show you that this is not the case at all. We will show you who is behind the counterfeiting and food counterfeiting. We will show you why. And then I have a tons of cases. I, don't, I will not have the time to go through all of them. But a snapshot of the, the various lies will give you the idea of how widespread the phenomenon is and which are the consequences for, for human health and for consumers' health. Slide. <clears throat> These will be the elements that we will, we will touch throughout my, my presentation, especially cases where we see organized crime involvement and which are kind of food that were really flooding into the market. And we will also touch a little bit uh, on the need to, to join forces and reinforce international cooperation if we really want to have a chance of uh, doing something against, against this phenomenon. Slide, please. So who is involved in counterfeiting and why? Well, we have both, both of the first two bullets that you see there. On the one side, we have the traditional organized crime structures, and we also have the loose networks. Why? Because counterfeiting, as many other different activities, is a crime of opportunity. We don't have to think that organized crime is specialized in a specific activity. The end of specialization of organized crime in specific areas happened many years ago. We don't have a criminal organizations focusing just on drug trafficking, another one on arms smuggling, another one in trafficking human beings. No, they're out there. They want to grasp every profit possibility. So they're, they're going to do everything. So you find the same guys who are doing drug trafficking which are involved in counterfeiting. The same guys who are dealing in uh, trafficking human beings for sexual exploitation who are doing counterfeiting. So fighting counterfeiting is part of the fight we have to do against every form and manifestation of transnational organized crime. <clears throat> they also build to organize the trafficking on alliances that have been created during the 70s. Why that? Because of the drug trade, of the boom of the narcotics drug trade. When you had to trade a product which was very far from the place of origin to the place of destination, you needed alliances. The traditional hierarchical and linked to the territory structure could not do that if the structure could not be linked to other organizations. So you had the alliances. And are the very same alliances that started by bringing narcotics from Afghanistan into US and Europe that now work at the same level to do several different types of illicit trade. Slide, please. So first case, we don't have just words here. We have cases. And when we talk about transnational organized crime, remember that for the UN is Article 2 of the Palermo Convention. So it's, uh, it's a very flexible definition that can be applied to several different types of organizations. We just require free, a group of three or more people acting in concert for a certain period of time for the pursuit 
of a financial or other material benefit. So three or four people acting in concert. What we see here is clearly a, a case of transnational organized crime when you had Camorra guys in Italy linked with Chinese organized crime and with organized crime in Turkey. In this case, it's just clothing apparel, but as I said, I have to set the stage for what you will see later. But in this operation, it's not just that you had a supplier from China selling its products to everyone. Oh no, you had the Camorra guys working together with the Chinese guys. Why? Because the level of production in China was directly linked to the level of demand of the Camorra guys in Italy. So it was really a, a transnational organized crime organization. The Turkey guys, they were mainly used for um, routing the shippings so that you don't see the origin. They used this as a stopover several times, and they stopped in several different countries to mask the origin of the good. But the last bullet is the more worrisome, because we will see the same patterns in the food. The guys were also owning legitimate shops, and they were selling the counterfeits as legitimate products. This is good for them because they do money laundering, but it means that consumers, they, they don't want to buy counterfeit. They are out there, they want to buy the original, well, they, they are, went, end up with the counterfeit. If you're talking about sports shoes, you're cheated, I'm sorry, that's it. And of course, the producer got a, an immense problem on the financial side. But if we talk about food, medicines, or other products, I mean, your health and safety is put at risk. Second slide, please. Here you have the same pattern, but look at the money. The guys were giving back, is the fifth bullet, five billion euro to their Chinese counterparts in four years. So it's a lot of money, and this is the real driving motive of organized crime. They want money. They do everything, no matter what. And in the last bullet, you see just the portion of assets seized to the Italian guys, to the Camorra guys. 20 million euros, 174 apartments and commercial warehouses, 85 enterprises. They were acting as legitimate producers with 85 enterprises, and so many other things. So this, this gives you the idea of the potential capacity of these guys. Next slide. Very briefly, let's just have a look at the numbers. These are, in general, investigations carried out by the anti-mafia in Italy. But look at the numbers. You see more or less the same patterns of the assets seized. A lot of money, a lot of investment, and that's the instance of organized crime. Next slide. All right, let's go back to the food. And where we go to the food, now we will include food and beverages, including alcoholic beverages, because people consume alcoholic beverages. If they're not safe, they can lead you to death. This is an investigation currently ongoing in the Czech Republic. When, when I presented you my previous slides, we saw how criminals were investing into illicit activities. It's not just that they buy the shops sometimes, they buy the whole production distribution chain, from the producer to the transportation means, the distributors, and the seller. That's what happened in the Czech Republic. These guys bought a producer of alcoholic beverages. They faked it, so they start pulling uh, into production fake alcohol. They bought the retailers, they bought the sellers, everything, till the consumer. And you have already something like 20 people death because they were buying in the supermarkets alcoholic beverages, thinking they were original, they were fake. And there's an investigation going on uh, by a prosecutor that works with us. Next slide, please. Other cases, there is an optional operation every year run by Interpol, WCO, and Olaf. Every year they have more countries working with them. This is an on-the-spot thing. They work one week just to spot the counterfeits and just to arrest the people. It's focused on food every year, and every year they have increasing numbers. Look at all the things that were seized. You have seafood in Italy. You have strawberries in France. You have 2,500 tons of adulterated food in total. You have uh, even adulterated spices in Turkey. So it's really cross-cutting. Every kind of food can be a, is counterfeiting and is put into the market. So we need to step up our prevention here 
to try and fight criminals and avoid them to put into the market these kind of things because all this is toxic, all this is dangerous for the human health. Next slide, please. Similar cases. Again, ju just to give you the idea, there is not one isolated case or one isolated operation. This is going on repeatedly. You have, here you see how it's not just the food alone, but the same criminal organization is doing a variety of counterfeiting activities, and they are flooding the markets all, to, all together. You have 10,000 liters of beverages and 60,000 counterfeit bottles and packaging materials. What does this mean? That if they have the counterfeit bottles and packaging materials, they are out there to put this into the legitimate shops. And that's the most worrisome element. Next slide, please. Similar thing, different countries, uh, not just the EU, but also other uh, 11 external, external countries. You, the thing that the operation was at the beginning focused on cigarettes, but when they started seizing, well, they, they found a lot of other materials, including shoes, toys, electronic devices, and food, and 7,000 liters of alcoholic beverages that were faked. Next slide, please. Very quickly here. It's global. Every, every country. We're not just talking about uh, developing countries here. It's in every country. It's happening in every country. Uh, luckily, they are seizing part of it, but other parts have not been seized at all, and they go into the market. What, what can we do as, a, as part of the international community to do it, to, to try and stop it, or at least reduce it? Well, first of all, what I first said in my very first slide, we need to raise the awareness on the problem. We need to raise the awareness on the, on the, on the problem. We need to to show to the national authorities that we need to fight this as a top priority. This is not a second class crime. This is extremely important. We need to put all our resources as we fight drug trafficking, as we fight trafficking human beings, we also need to fight these kind of crimes as organized crime. Sometimes it's difficult to convince the member state that they can apply the UN TOC, the Transnational Organized Crime Convention, to these kind of crimes because they don't realize that organized crime is involved. But if you don't investigate properly, how, how are you going to find the link with organized crime? Next slide. So one of the things we are doing is, um, I know this isn't, sorry, this is another interesting thing. This is an exercise I would like to, to do. Like, just think about what could happen. There is a clan in Italy who monopolized the fish and mozzarella market in Naples, in a specific area of Naples called Qualiano. They uh, forced, uh, similar as the protection money, they forced uh, the shops and the restaurants to buy a specific kind of fish from them. And to, in all the pizzerias, they had to buy a specific kind of mozzarella just from them. No choice, otherwise I burn the shop into ashes. Done. So they, they, they started buying that. Well, if you are the only supplier of cheese, if you are the only supplier of food, and the law is not really able to control you in that because there's no traceability scheme, well, you can sell whatever you want to the shops. You can give whatever you want to the shops. Could be hazardous, could be toxic. No one is checking that. So what if, I mean, it didn't happen in this case. They were just selling, I mean, forcing to buy, people to buy uh, mozzarella and fish, it was not toxic, but it could happen. There is another case where they bought the distribution of dairy products for the south of Italy. The whole distribution was called, was called Euro milk. It was in the hands of Camorra. They didn't put the counterfeits into the market, okay, but it could have happened. And if you own the distributor, who's going to check? No one's going to check. Next slide. This is the right one now. So this is a study we did uh, in the Euro Mediterranean area, try to compare uh, all the different legislation uh, that uh, are in place against counterfeiting with a focus on, on food fraud and, and food counterfeiting. We work with the Italian Ministry of Economic Development because they were hosting the Rome Declaration, bringing together all the Euro Mediterranean countries to fight against counterfeiting. 
and we work also with the Italian Ministry of Agriculture. It's out there. You can download from the website. Um, it sh the, the English version should be up in a couple of weeks. But, and this will be brought to the countries of the Euromed area to try and say, okay, look, we have a problem. The, the laws usually is not the problem. The law is there. It's not applied. So we have to work together to train, to raise awareness, to apply the law in these cases. And my last slide, and I promise I finish, yeah, is another thing we are creating in Geneva. I mean, we always hear that we have to bring together different stakeholders. Uh, it has been done, uh, bringing together public and private sector. It has been done usually discussing current problems. It has not been done discussing future problems. So we want to try and anticipate which are the future risks. Um, so we are creating a platform where we will have also the technology community in there. There is a, a lot of talk about how technology can be on the one side a threat and on the other side a resource to find new threats. We want to discuss exactly this. Food fraud will be one of the, of the issues. We will create threat scenarios. Um, that we will validate. We will present this to the stakeholders, especially the technology community, and say, how would you respond to that? If you're able to do this kind of matchmaking, we will go then to the member states and, and tell them, look, we have possible ideas for you. Let's try and work together, at least to try and see if we can fight these criminals which are profiting by putting consumers' health and safety at risk. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions. Uh, while, while you think of your questions, um, I, I wanted to ask both of you a quick question. So you've laid the case very well. Um, we know that climate change is happening and we know it's impacting our food supply. We know that those most uh, vulnerable will be affected the most. And on top of it, we're seeing that there's a lot of counterfeiting in the food industry and that is having an added pressure and will probably become you know, a, a lot more amplified as the, the impacts of climate change are being felt. So we know the problem. What are the solutions? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in my view, there is no solution, no perfect solution, no silver bullet to do that. Mm. The solution is a puzzle and we need to bring together the different pieces of the puzzle because of the complexity of the problem. You have the criminal side, you have the legal side, you have the development side, you have the, the private sector side, you have the national authorities side. Yeah. So I think uh, the underlying motive in my presentation was, look, we need to have um, a strategy that looks at all and every pieces of the puzzle. And what, why, what we are trying to do, especially in Geneva with my last slide, is trying to bring together the different stakeholders. Because if we, if we don't facilitate the discussion from different perspectives, it will be difficult to, to have a, even a strategy. Because you, you can tackle that just from the legal perspective, it's not enough. You can tackle that from the organized crime perspective, it's not enough. I think all the bits and pieces together um, raising awareness also to consumers, raising awareness to the law enforcement, what they have to do, training the law enforcers, working with the national authorities to step up what they have from the, from the legal framework. Everything is, uh, in my view, is, is part of this strategy. Especially, uh, but probably because it's, it's what I do every day, yeah. is, is work in a, in a way in which we see the overarching organized crime scheme and we want to fight organized crime. Because if you, if you go and say, look, we have to, to step up our procedures against fraud, many member states, believe it or, or not, they say, okay, but we have everything, so we don't need to do that. But if you, sometimes if you play the card of, we have to fight against organized crime, mm -hmm. no one can say no. So it's, this is one of the things we are, we are trying to do. Makes sense. Well, it's... Um Surely it's complicated, but there are very simple solutions to even factors that seem completely away from and, and untouchable from, from us. Um, I've spoken about responsibility. There is an issue of how we act responsibly uh, in, in, in food, 
okay? And uh, one of them is how much food are we wasting daily? Uh, there is a huge issue uh, about numbers of food insecurity at world level. The issue is that there is enough food to feed everyone. The, par the, the problem is that is, uh, the food is, in a way, allocated only in single parts of the world where wealth is, uh, but is often produced as well in parts where there is a lot of food scarcity. There is a lot of food insecurity. Uh, thinking about uh, main producers, we, we spoke about Ethiopia, one of the main producers of coffee, for example. And we drink coffee every day, uh, not just at Starbucks, but also here uh, in the lobby. Uh, the point is understanding what is the level of responsibility that we want to engage in understanding uh, what is the implication that we have in the food insecurity at world level? Uh, how much water are we wasting daily that is fresh water that might be uh, uh, a possibility of drinking water for the rest of the world? Of course, there are, there are things that cannot be transported that easily. But as we transport fish and as we transport uh, food and commodities, uh, uh, such as water as well, that has been, uh, has become a commodity uh, in the last few years. I mean, is uh, if you go to the New York Stock Exchange market now, you can buy stocks of water. Uh, so I think that their solution is, as a, again, uh, let me repeat, is is the obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the the levels of food security. So we have it at state level, uh, at international level, thinking the role of the World Bank in producing infrastructures that are uh, able to provide water to populations in Africa or, or in Asia, uh, but as well the level of responsibility that we have at the community level and at personal level. Uh, thinking how much, again, how much waste of food we, we do in our daily life uh, because of standards that we rightly approach to arrive, but those standards are not reflecting actually the needs of, of, of the rest of the world. So maybe practical solutions are very easy to take. Uh, if we demand less food that is going to be waste, then maybe the supply-demand market will try to look at other markets where to allocate food and maybe provide food to uh, undernourished populations. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Um, do we have any more roaming mics? No, not right now. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Paola Hernandez, and I'm here as an action fellow with the Alliance for Climate of Education. And um, while we all know climate is an intersectional, intersectional um, topic, it affects so much, and we know it has an impact on crime, food, and justice. However, there are folks who don't see this correlation. What would you say to the general public and young people in particular to make this connection and make climate more relevant and urgent? Thank you. I think that's more for you. I think that um, we have a setting of um, rules and regulations that are fundamental. Uh, I've spoken about the Human Rights uh, Universal Declaration that is in a way empowering uh, uh, our world system and the international system to look at the necessities of food security as well. Um, what we don't have is, uh, and because of incapacity and impossibility sometimes, is, a, is an adequate a set of legislative work that actually goes into um, 
the customization of what we should do or not do in the, in the realm of food security. Uh, I think that part of this is related to the fact that uh, one of the things that I was appealing to you on, on not to waste is a moral responsibility. So there is a lot of ethics and morality implied in, in the daily activity that we have towards climate change. Of course, there, is, uh, there are regulations like the Paris Agreement that are actually uh, capable of uh, guiding us. Uh, but then is, we, we cannot rely only on, uh, on the necessity of uh, industry and, uh, uh, and, and big markets to adapt to the climate change conditions, uh, transportation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have to fight for, for more, uh, of course, and thinking about transportation, how fast was the change in, 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 in trying to develop electric cars now that uh, uh, are going to be, in a way, more ecologically friendly. Uh, this has nothing to do with mass atrocities or, or, or political instability, but at, at the same time, yes, it has to do. It has to do with, with the whole dimension of how we actually connect to the environment, how we actually morally think ourselves as part of the of the world system and uh, and how our single uh, very daily activities are affecting uh, climate change and, and to my position of today food insecurity but as well everything that is connected to that uh, as i told you Food security is part of, of the seven dimensions of human security, but all of them are completely interconnected. And uh, if, we, if we focus only on one of them, being food security or being environmental security, but we don't have a larger picture of the other six dimensions, depending on which one are we looking at, uh, we will have an unbalanced capacity to actually deal with the problems that we are facing as, as world population. I, I hope I've responded to your, uh, to your question. Maybe just to emphasize that, you know, it, it is a very much an interconnected world that we're living in. And um, as, with, as we see the climate change threat affecting our food supply and food security, the transition to a low carbon future, to one that is more resilient, is actually the great opportunity to also solve our food insecurity challenges. Um, and maybe that's one of the takeaway messages is that, you know, the challenges that we're faced is actually one of our greatest opportunities because they're all rectifiable and we can, we can work on all of them. So we've got time for one last question, if there is one. Um, just scanning the audience, anybody? We've got a question in the back. Thank you. I'm glad it's I'm from Cameroon. I'm an attorney and a consultant in environmental matters. I have followed with a lot of interest to what you said about uh, the quality and quantity of food as affected by climate change. But while we tackle this problem, don't you think the immediate problem could have been that of distribution? Because in my country, we have climate problems have brought us a lot of drought and a lot of other problems. But when we come this way to the West in the United States, we have seen so much food waste because of the standards which are extremely high. With all due respect I have for the authorities which set those standards, I still want to think that this food which is wasted is not completely bad food. Can't this food be channeled to Africa while the climatic problems which are caused and are affecting food, uh, food quality and quantity is tackled? Why can't you see how to transfer some of this distribution of food just as you distribute oil? Is there no way you can distribute water to Africa? I think that is extremely immediate. I'm not really saying there's no climatic problems, but while we do, we tackle this problem, which is going to be piecemeal, it's going to take a long time, I think it's extremely urgent and immediate for Africans to benefit from the abundance you have out here. Can you please try to design a project, a program of how to transfer the leftovers out here to African countries. Thank you. Yeah, I think 
you, you rightly said something that I was expanding before. Um, there is a problem of distribution. But the problem of distribution is not just US versus Africa, which is a large continent actually. It's composed of more than 50 countries. So it's, uh, it might be US vs Cameroon. Uh, the point as well here that we are, that we are trying to make, and uh, the Budapest Center just released uh, it's, uh, it's a report on African regional communities and mass atrocities prevention with the intention and idea of uh, trying to provide a policy evaluation of how regional communities in Africa are, are actually able to tackle compending issues of, that are drawing to the point of mass atrocity. But in order to prevent mass atrocities, we are actually trying to tackle very basic lines such as food security, for example, or water scarcity. Uh, 